please join me in welcoming Jim Wolfenson. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and let me start by saying thank you to Bob and Dottie King for what I think is a remarkable initiative and one that is certainly much needed. And I think all of us are very grateful to you both for taking the lead in doing this. I'm sure Stanford is very lucky to have you. And, uh, and from what I've seen in the morning discussions, it's off to a very good start. Uh, I have, I think, 20 minutes to cover the entire field of development. Uh, which will lead a little time uh, for questions. But let, let me start by saying that uh, the purpose of the Institute, I think, is to deal with three particular subjects, if I understand correctly, the institutional, the managerial, and the technological. And I think it is very good indeed that uh, we should try and bring this whole field down to three specific areas in which there can be particular attention given to research and to development and to teaching, which we talked about this morning. I don't have any great knowledge of the plans of the professorial group other than what I learned this morning. And in the next day and a half, I think they're going to be telling you what it is they're interested in doing. So don't let me preempt uh, their pitch. What I'd like to do in starting this off is to really draw attention to something that I learned very early in my activities in the development field, and then carried over to uh, my work at the World Bank uh, for that decade. And it basically is that you cannot think of any of these initiative, institutional, managerial, technological, or indeed any particular initiative in development, unless you have a framework in which you're operating. If the framework isn't there, then by doing uh, projects, you will find very quickly that they've been for naught. I remember first when I was down in Ghana on one of my early trips, I went to see uh, a school. The school had been built two years before, and all that was left of it was a shell. The pipes had been taken out, the windows had been taken out, the lights had been taken out. And I had a picture of what it was previously uh, in that two years. And it got me thinking, you know, this is really terrible. The Ghanaians don't know how to, how to uh, deal with things even when they get them. Until I realized that it was not really the Ghanaians' fault or the community's fault. Nothing had been put into the systemic approach to having a school. They didn't have separate toilets for the boys and girls. They didn't have a methodology of getting the kids to school. Uh, they did not have uh, an appropriate way in which they could close the school off at night and guard it. Uh, they did not have adequate textbooks. The girls could not go to school because they couldn't get there. And in any event, they were needed at home for household work. And therefore, their parents wouldn't let them go. Uh, and so on and so on, until we realized that if you're going to build a school, you'd better keep in mind how you're going to run it, how you're going to get the kids there, how you're going to fix the parents to make sure that they, they're in support, which, by the way, in the end, you generally solve by paying them a few dollars if they get the kids to school. That in order to get the kids to school and have them healthy, you've got to take them for health tests, if you're going to have them effective in the school, you want to try and stimulate them in the first five years of life, which is well known for as a development issue. And if you don't do that, you'll get kids going to school that are already somewhat damaged by the time that they get there. And I could go on and extend to you the, the range of both the prior requirements and also the objectives of going to that school. But the point is that when you start thinking about doing an individual project, you have to look at it within its overall context. You cannot just say, I'll put down a school. Because if that's all you're doing, you're almost certain that it'll be stables and it'll be torn apart within two years. The other thing is that in the development field, 
and in many countries I saw this, you would find that if there was one school built, you might have five schools built. Because all of the different agencies of different governments and private organizations decide that they need to build a school. And so instead of having no school, you'll have five schools. And one will be a religious school, one will be a local school, one will be uh, a school put up by uh, an international agency, one will be a national uh, supported school. And that leads you to the next thing, that development without some planning and without some integration of effort is a tremendously wasteful thing and can be very wasteful. And one of the things that uh, we discovered in the work that I was doing is that when people have money to build a school, they don't want anybody else interfering, particularly someone that has nothing to do with it. Then the third thing that happens, uh, typically, when money is provided for these projects, and I use the school simply as a, an example, is that the wastage that occurs in terms of individual projects becomes profound. I concluded that in many of the countries in which I was operating, with which we were operating at the bank, that the losses on projects could be as much as 80% in terms of the money that got to the project. The losses being as a result of a multiplicity of effort, straight stealing, uh, which was probably the major cause of the whole issue of corruption, bad planning, and not only stealing by the promoters, but by the government and by all the people that are associated with it. And so the prime issue which we needed to deal with in so many of the projects in which we were operating was to make sure that you had transparency and you could actually make effective the projects that you were trying to bring about. And that's true not just of physical projects, it's also true of the initiatives which our hosts are talking about. How do you make sure that the money that you're going to put into institutional, managerial, or technological change will in fact get there? And who is monitoring it? So the issue of management, which is so adequately dealt with in this institution, the issue of management becomes absolutely central to the effectiveness that you can have in the development process. And it is one of the principal reasons that I think it's so great that this school should be situated here because it's not just business management that we're talking about, we're talking about management of projects in the development field. I jotted down uh, the four things that the Board of Governors of the World Bank decided in 1998 were the principles that you needed to have in these projects. The first one was develop strategies that should be comprehensive. That covers the point that I just made. A school alone is not comprehensive. If you want to do an education program, it has to have all those other things associated with it. And we developed a thing called the Comprehensive Development Framework, which dealt with the social, the structural considerations, such as expanding, not just in individual projects, but expanding the totality of how you approach development. And it starts with education, healthcare, it gets on with infrastructure, it gets on with roads that you need to get there, with training of the next generation. I'm only hinting it now because I've only got 20 minutes, but the truth of the matter is that you have to create around each of these projects an environment in which you're not going to lose something with the water flowing through that hole. You have to have uh, a systemic approach. The second thing is, that you shouldn't impose it either from Stanford or from Harvard or from Washington or from the outside. The thing that you learn when you get into the field, and I went to over 140 countries, is that the countries themselves know their problems and want to be part of the solution. The issue is listen to what the people in the countries are doing. Don't have your meetings in Washington or in Geneva. Have your meetings in the countries themselves. Because they're the place that really has the responsibility of delivery. They're the place that needs it. And they will always know more than you do 
about the country and their culture. And that's why I think even in what this institution uh, is talking about, the SEED institution, you're talking, and you mentioned it this morning, of the very great need to have local offices in many of these places so that you can, in fact, draw on the experience of the locality. And you would have thought that that was something that everybody was doing, but in fact, it's not what everybody was doing. The typical uh, rationale in international organizations, the official ones, was that if you wanted to get promoted, you had to stay in Washington or Geneva or wherever the head office was. And so you made these trips, but actually living there was not something that you really wanted to do. The alternative was, or the other side of the story was, that in the non-governmental organizations, most of them would go out into the field. And you'd have five, eight, 10 organizations from NGOs all offering to do the same things in the local community and not talking to each other. So you'd have five Land Rovers and you'd have five offices and you'd have five teams that were there ready to do what was, ever, was to be done. And that was part of the cause of the loss of the funds that were going into development. And so what was essential was to try and bring them together so that you could have a more rational approach if you could find a leader that was acceptable. And over the recent years, I think that's happened more and more with the ability of civil society to get together and to deal with it. So in the countries, you had governments, you have donors, you have civil society, you have academia, you have the private sector, all stakeholders in trying to get something done. And if you don't listen to what the others are doing, you have replication, you have confusion, and certainly you have a lot of waste. So the issue of management, which this school can deal with, is a critical issue. And by the way, provides a great opportunity for careers, not only for the three professors that have already been named, but I hope for a lot of people that will come through the school. And then there's the issue of um, measuring performance. How do you measure performance? How do you get measurable results? Do you measure it just on the amount of money that's being spent and how quickly you spend it? Which, by the way, until recent years was mainly the way that development expenditures were measured. Or do you look at the effectiveness of what's been happening and try and see whether you have, are approaching or nearly approaching the sort of results that you had hoped to do. And why I'm saying all this to you is that you talk about development as being a wonderful, socially responsible thing, which indeed it is. Addressing the question of the billion under a dollar and a quarter a day, and by the way, the three and a half billion under $2.50 a day, which is your next target after you've done the billion. Uh, so we have plenty of work to do. You have this issue of how is it that you can, in a local community, design a program which is effective locally, which hopefully is replicable, where you can have not only organizational interchange locally, but where you can have the experience being made possible internationally on the basis of what it is you learn, and an exchange of views on what the donor countries are learning. And then you have another issue. The donor countries learn. Many of them, but not all, are democratic. But they're also subject to their own challenges. In the last three years, as I need hardly tell you, the situation in Europe starting with Greece, Portugal, Spain, the situation in the European market, the situation in the economy in our country, have all changed dramatically since many of the plans were made for development. And so what we've seen is both a visible reduction of finance and support, and also a lot of kidding about what it is that is going on. They don't want to announce that they've cut an aid program by X percent. But the truth is, it's going on all around the world. And delays are being made, and the work is not being done. And so the issue of continuity, the issue of focus, 
which is so important in business, is really not there from the rich countries to the less rich countries. Until 2002, it was easy to think of it. You had 80% of the world uh, was in the developing countries. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 80% of the, of the uh, income of the world was in the rich countries. 20% was in the poor countries. So you had a billion people with 80% of the income, and you had 5 billion people with 20% of the income. And for more than 30 years, plus or minus 1 or 2%, that was the situation. And so we in the rich countries used to argue with each other as whether you give another 0.1 or 0.2 percent. You may remember that there was a target set of 7 tenths of 1 percent of the income of rich countries to go to development. It never made it in most countries. And even that was uh, unstable in the sense that we didn't achieve the objective. What is happening now are really two things. The first thing that's happening, which you should recognize, is that the income streams are changing. That 80-20 is now 65-35. In other words, the developing countries uh, have 35% of the global income. And there are dramatic changes taking place in terms of who is going to be running the world in terms of economic activity, and indeed probably in terms also of political activity. The expectation is that by 2050, unlike the 80-20 that made us all comfortable in having a G7 and feeling that the Europeans plus Japan had all the money, we're now finding that there is a big change occurring. And the expectations are that by 2050, that 80% which we had for so many years will be down to 35%. And the developing countries, which used to have the 20%, will be up to 65%. And of that 65%, 50% of it will be in the hands of China and India. 50%. That is a world that is very different than the world we're talking about today. It's a world of 9.5 billion people at that time, in which 50% of the global income will be in two countries, and close to 60% in Asia. This is a remarkable change, which is manifested in very many ways and really not understood by my generation at all. The truth of the matter is that there are 350,000 Chinese students studying a year abroad, 330,000 Indian students studying abroad, 130,000 Chinese studying in this country, I think 120,000 Indians studying here. In response, we have 13,000 students studying in China and 3,100 in India. And if I talk about this at universities or in front of uh, those students and their parents, they all say, that's terrible. I'm going to send my daughter or son to China. Or I'm going to do something else. And the next day, they've forgotten it. But the truth of the matter is that that is not just a statistical challenge. That is a change in our world. That is a change that is happening at a very, very rapid rate. And where the dynamics are, that we're having a shift uh, to Asia, which none of us has seen before, and was last seen in 1815, when China and India were 50% of the global GDP, and before that in 1500. So it's happened before, and it's happening again. And we're wholly unprepared, generally, for it. As you look forward to see what's going to happen, by 2050, the GDP of China will be $70, billion, $70 trillion, the US $38 trillion, India $38 trillion, then Brazil $11 trillion, Mexico $9, Russia $8, Indonesia $7, Japan nearly $7, UK $5, Germany $5. The fascinating thing about that is that only three of the G7 are then in the top 10. And they're replaced by many other countries, which include India, Mexico, Brazil, which in my day were the sort of countries that we were trying to help. 
this is the drama of the change that is going on and is a dramatic change and a great challenge to all of us here and indeed to the world that is coming. But there is one area of the world which to our, to our hosts is critically important, which is what about the billion people that are living in absolute poverty under a dollar and 25 cents a day? The substantial majority of them are in Africa. Not all, but a substantial majority, at least 70%, in 53 countries. And it is a very, very difficult area in which to bring about change. First of all, you have the massive issue of corruption, which I'm afraid still is endemic in so many parts of the country. The second thing is that you don't have a core, a significant core of educated people that are prepared to give themselves to public service. If you're educated and you're from a good family, you go into business. Or you try and you very rarely go to government in the past. Fortunately, what we're seeing is that there is now a change occurring and that many young Africans are starting to think that they can be responsible. They can still make an adequate amount of money and they can still bring about a change in that continent. But Africa remains at the epicenter of the issues that we're going to try and confront. And it is very, very difficult to talk to young Africans about entrepreneurship, about the issues that our founders are concerned with, managerial issues and technology, when all too many of them can't read, have not had the education system, and are just not prepared to take the responsibilities. So we have a huge challenge for educational institutions like Stanford and by initiatives that are taken by development institutions to get out and bring about the human capital that is essential in these countries. You can't do it all at once. And the last thing I'll say is that the whole of this challenge uh, which has been put to us by the kings is not an instant solution. It is something that will take decades and continuous effort. And that's why housing it here in Stanford is a wonderful thing and gives us an opportunity, I hope, to think about hope and to think about a better world that all of you are going to create than the world that I had some part in. Thank you very much. Yeah. If you, those, num <coughs> those numbers you were quoting as to the size of the various economies, what, uh, what lies behind them in terms of income distribution? Do we expect that, sorry, the, the numbers you were quoting on the size of the various economies, including some that are still filled with hundreds of millions of poor people, uh, when you, see China being a $70 trillion economy. What does that uh, assume about the income distribution in China? Are there still going to be poor people in China with those kinds of numbers? Well, <clears throat> until 2001, it was, and even until 2011, it was clear that the middle class was two thirds in the rich countries, as I described and one third in the rest of the world. That was on a purchasing power parity basis. That wasn't even dollar for dollar. That, that was allowing for the change in the value of the dollar. It's thought that within 10 years, it'll be the reverse. Two thirds, particularly in Asia, and one third in the so-called rich countries. Estimates vary whether it's 10 years or 15 years, but it's in that time frame that that will change. And this is reflected in the GDP statistics that I was giving you. If you're going to see the statistics move from 20% of the world's income to those 5 billion people, who are now 6 billion, and you're going to see that now going to 35 and then ultimately to 65, you have to have a greater push. Now, it would be possible for it to go to a few ruling families, but that is not the case typically 
in China and India. There are some very rich families in both places. But the weight of the population is, is such, and the weight of the, actually the politics is such, that it's my belief that you're going to see a much broader base of a distribution. Two places will be challenging. The current one is in the Arab world. And if you take Saudi Arabia, you probably got half the income in the hands of five, 7,000 members of the royal family. That, by the way, is an inherent danger in that country in terms of political stability. And the other place where it is at the moment hugely uneven is Africa. By the way, also in some parts of Latin America, but improving in Latin America. But in Africa, uh, governance is not a great thing. And when you get into power, it's hard to get you out. And corruption is unfortunately very high. I should tell you that when I got to the World Bank, Nick will remember this, the first time in 1995, in my second speech at an annual meeting, I uh, sent the draft to the general counsel. And I had a phrase in I was dealing with, the cancer of corruption. And he came to my office and he said, will you come outside? I said, why can't you talk to me here? He said, no, I'd like to talk to you outside. And we went out into the atrium and he whispered to me. He said, Jim, you cannot use the C word. And I said, what the hell is the C word? He said, corruption. I said, why can't I use the C word? He said, half the members of the board represent corrupt countries. And I tell you this because uh, six months later, every, every delegate talked about corruption with the other people, <laughs> not with their own country. But the issue of corruption is still fundamental, unfortunately. And um, I regret to say that it is one of the bigger challenges that we have to face. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask about your thoughts on prospects for Africa. So my understanding is Africa is roughly at the same income per capita level it may have been 20, 30, 40 years ago. To what extent do you see things improving going forward? In particular, I wondered whether as the world gets richer, footloose multinationals, for example, looking for low-cost production tend to move to Africa, the spillovers. Um, I, you know, my sense is the world seems to be more optimistic in Africa looking ahead than it did recently. Do you have much more to Yeah, it's slightly more... Uh, it's slightly more, but the average per capita income is still under $1,000 a year. And the most extreme projections I've seen for 2050 is an average, pop, an average per capita income of $5,000 per year. That's at a time when India will be 25000 and China will be 40000 and we'll be 80000 or 100000 in the richest countries. So you have to think about a world in which you have 2 billion people in Africa more than 20%, no longer running around with spears and with no means of communications, but with cellular radios and with the means of moving around. Two billion uh, that are dissatisfied in terms of, the, of their share of what they're getting. So they can move with their feet, which they do into Europe and in other places. And there are all sorts of things that they can do if they're unhappy center of the drug trade in many areas is now shifted to Africa. Uh, there are many good things happening in Africa. I'm not, I, I must say that uh, categorically in terms of both education, in terms of, in terms of um, new ideas, and some very good leaders. I'm, I'm deeply impressed by the changes in Africa in the last 15 years. But if, you're, if, you're obje if your assumption is that the size of the population is going to double in the next 30, 30 to 40 years. And if you still have a decent increase in annual income, the per capita income is held back by the population growth. And that's what's happening. Now, the interesting thing is that it will have the youngest population in the world while we're getting older. So the question is, what is going to happen in these centers of increased population growth, and what is it that Africa can do in terms of training the young people? And that, I think, is 
something that is a challenge for educational institutions and for the governments in those countries. And I think gives some hope to Africa. about corruption in the following sense, that many of the countries that you are discussing have corruption as an, not an essential, the essential part of the political system, right? The people in power couldn't govern without corruption. So you're not going to be able to get rid of it entirely. Somehow the problem has to be addressed. But how do you think about dealing with that issue? Well, you have to do it in two ways. Uh, in Singapore, if you want to get a country, company registered, you have to go to two people and you get it registered. In many of the other countries, you have to go to 30 or 40 people. And if you go to 30 or 40 people to get your company registered, or to get a driver's license, or to get whatever it is that you want, uh, each one of those steps costs a few dollars. And the reason that it costs a few dollars is it has become accepted part of the system that it's part of the salary scale. And you buy your job, depending on the income that you can expect from that job. And that is, can only be dealt with by a clean government coming in and trying to establish, first of all, a proper tax system so that they've got the income. And secondly, a more rational payment mechanism for public officials. If you can do that, then you won't have 35 steps to get your approval. You'll have five steps or three steps or four steps. The interesting thing is that you can measure the level of corruption in a curious way by the number of steps you need to have to get approvals on various things. And so this is starting to happen in some countries. And you, as I said before to the kings, it's not going to happen overnight. But what is important is that you start the initiative so that you can make sure that as you press it down the road, it will get done. It didn't get done, by the way, in England or the United States in five minutes either. Uh, you need to remember that it was not always uh, so perfectly honest uh, as uh, it is thought to be in some places today. And by the way, corruption has not totally left even our country. Uh, the numbers just get bigger. Uh, but. Um, I think that the direction is set. And what is interesting now is that in developing countries, a lot of interesting things are happening. First of all, uh, there's a woman called Ngozi Awolowo who worked at the bank, who's now the finance minister of uh, Nigeria. She was a close colleague of mine. She puts on the doors of all the schools in the educational program the amount of money that has been sent from head office to that school. You think that would be not a particularly genius thing to do. It has indeed transformed the amount of money that gets in the educational system to schools. She just decided that she would let each community know what they were being sent. And when 30% of it was arriving on what they'd sent from Lagos, things start to change. And it's the community that does it. It's not a policeman, it's the community. And so there are many ways in which transparency can have a big effect. And personally, I think that this is the way that in many countries it's going to go. It's the same thing is true in transfer of money and resources. Once we have the telephone to move money around, there's less chance of being robbed as you try and use the financial system. And that's already happening. That's why people are using the phone. So there, technology, I think, can make a big difference, particularly if it brings about transparency. And it's my hope that as that moves forward, we'll see some significant improvements. I've got a question here. Um, at the moment, a small set of countries are sort of the deliverers of resources for initiatives as this. Do you think that in, uh, say, ten de two or three decades away that we'll see China and India and those countries playing that sort of role as well as um, something that may be more uh, financially driven? You mean helping developing countries? Yes. Well, that's already happening. Um, 
they make more noise about it at the moment than substance, to be quite honest. And they'll announce a $10 billion program. And it will more or less get through. But $10 billion in the international scene is still only a tip relative to what is needed for the development of these countries. But they're much better than we are in terms of following up. I mean, the Premier and the Vice Premier and the Prime Minister of China go to Africa never less than once or twice a year, each one. They don't have immediate um, financial return, but they're establishing themselves and they're now a million Chinese living in Africa. And the issue there is natural resources. So they're staking a claim uh, where our president and the leaders of many other countries have maybe never been to Africa. If they've been there once, it was for two days. So the identification of these opportunities and the following up on them by the Asians, including the Indians, who, by the way, have a big resident community in East Africa as well, they've got a good start on the African development. They understand it. They've got people that live there. Uh, there's some friction with the Chinese because they're not, they're not really uh, settling in as members of the community. They have their separate communities, essentially, when they're there. But you would have to say that the move towards natural resources and the linkage with China and India, particularly China, is fundamental. And it's what's driving it. It's not, I think, good heart although there are many Chinese with very good hearts. Uh, it is that as a matter of public policy for the natural resources that are going to be demanded and are being demanded by the giant population in China, Africa becomes a very important oil well and mine. And by the way, now also uh, a place to grow food where there, you know, there are many initiatives going on to, to do food production in Africa. I think I've just about done my time, haven't I? Well, Thank you.